Hello friends and welcome to our video lecture on topic S2.3, the metallic model. Our guiding question for today, what determines the metallic nature and properties of an element? These are our understandings if you want to pause the video and read them. And our objectives for today, we're going to describe metallic character and structure. We're going to explain the relationship between metallic structure and the properties of metals. Those properties include electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, malleability, and ductility. And then we're going to take a quick look at the relative strengths of metallic bonds. Metallic structures form generally amongst metals, but sometimes also metalloids. When we have electrostatic forces of attraction between metal cations and a sea of delocalized electrons. What does that even mean? Well, metals have very low electronegativity. They also have very low electron affinity they have very high metal character. And so what happens is they are not very good at pulling on their valence electrons. The more metalish you are, the more likely you are to give up those valence electrons. And what happens is, literally, those valence electrons are released into the sea of delocalized or free electrons. Rather than have an atom and its electrons in orbitals for just that one atom, those valence electrons are released and they can flow freely around all of the metal cations that are in that metallic structure. The result is, again, that C of free or delocalized electrons and there is an electrostatic force of attraction between those positively charged metal cations that lost electrons and the negatively charged C of free electrons. The degree of metal character definitely depends on that very low electronegativity, electron affinity. That sea of delocalized or free electrons in metallic structures leads to a lot of super cool properties. One of those properties is electrical conductivity. The conductivity of electricity depends on the ability for charged particles, ions, or electrons to move. If we've got a bunch of free electrons, it's pretty easy to give them a push and get them to move. And that's what we can see in this diagram here. Those electrons, given a little bit of a push from whatever electrical charge it is that we have, are going to cause those electrons to flow. That flow of electrons is electrical conductivity. Similar is the idea of thermal conductivity or being able to conduct heat. A heat source is going to lead to an increase in kinetic energy. Temperature is all about kinetic energy, which is the energy of movement. And so when we add heat to a metal, what happens is that those cations wiggle and jiggle a little bit more because they've got more kinetic energy. That causes them to bump into other cations that bump into other cations that also bump into electrons. And so these guys are able to bump into each other and then that wiggly jiggly kinetic energy can be transferred from one particle to the next, from one cation to an electron to a cation to more electrons. And this is thermal conductivity. Interestingly, as we increase the temperature, because we've got more things wiggling and jiggling, it's harder to get those free electrons to flow in a direction. And so we see in this graph, an increase in temperature leads to an increase in resistance to electrical conductivity. There's less conductivity for most metals as temperature increases. And then there are superconductors. Superconductors are super in that below some critical temperature, and it's a different temperature for different superconductors, there's literally zero electrical resistance. It's super easy for those electrons to flow at those low temperatures in superconductors. Here are some known superconductive elements. Lots of metals, also a few compounds, can act as superconductors. But you see here that once we get to a higher temperature, that resistance the lesser ability to conduct electricity does increase. Metallic structures are also malleable and ductile. These properties also depend on that sea of free electrons. Malleability is the ability to be bent or dented, molded into some shape. Ductility is the ability to be drawn out into a wire shape. 
Why are metals malleable? Well, let's look at this metallic structure. We have all of these cations and then flowing around those cations is that sea of delocalized or free electrons. Notice that there is no specific bond direction. There is a force of attraction all around in all directions. That means that should there be some force applied to a piece of this metallic structure, we can just take whole chunks of those cations and shift them back a little bit. We're still going to have that sea of free electrons. They are still able to flow around all of those cations. We still have our electrostatic force of attraction between the sea of free electrons and those metal cations, but because there is no specific direction for those bonds, we can absolutely shuffle them around a little bit. And we're going to wrap up with a look at relative strengths of metallic bonds. Much like when we looked at the lattice enthalpies of ionic bonding, we're going to consider the radius of the cations and the charge of the cations. These are going to influence the strength of metallic bonds. We're also going to add in the density of those delocalized electrons in that sea of electrons. Let's look at lithium and sodium to start. So lithium and sodium, both alkali metals, both are going to have a charge of positive one when they release their one valence electron. The difference is that lithium is in period two and sodium is in period three. When lithium loses that one valence electron, it's going to have only one energy level of electrons left. When sodium loses its one valence electron, it's going to have two whole energy levels of electrons left. That means that the distance between the sea of free electrons and the nucleus of those metal cations is greater than it is in lithium. That lower distance is going to lead to a stronger metallic bond, which is going to lead to a higher melting point. More energy is needed to break that force of attraction between the delocalized electrons and the cations. In sodium, less energy is needed, which is why the melting point is lower, in order to break that force of attraction between the free electrons and the metal cations. Let's now take into consideration charge. So sodium and aluminum, both in period three, both are going to give up valence electrons, which is going to lead to them both having just two electron energy levels. However, sodium only gives up one valence electron, whereas aluminum gives up three. And so the charge of aluminum is quite a bit higher than the charge of the ion of sodium. And also the electron density is greater. We have three times as many electrons in the aluminum's sea of delocalized electrons as we have in sodium's, again, because three valence electrons were released. This is going to lead to an incredibly high melting point for aluminum, 660 degrees Celsius, which is significantly higher than sodium's 98 degrees Celsius. And on that note, and in under 10 minutes, we have finished our video lecture. Hopefully you're feeling pretty confident about answering the guiding question, what determines the metallic nature and properties of an element. It's all about that sea of delocalized electrons. Our objectives, we describe metallic character and structure. We talked about that relationship between metallic structure and the properties of metals, all about those valence electrons that are released into that sea of delocalized electrons. And then we talked about that relative strength of metallic bonding. Great work today.